Rebecca, is it fully priced? No, it's definitely not fully priced. If, if you look at consensus today, it's got US CPI going back to 2.3% by the end of the year next year. And obviously, 7% CPI, what we saw this morning, that's not likely to stick around. But even if inflation moderates, you have to think about the components. What are each of those doing? And two of the most important ones, in our view, wages and housing, including rents, those are going to be sticky. And they, in our view, have a lot of upside risk. So we think inflation is likely to be significantly above what's discounted and, of course, the Fed's target, unless they decide they're going to hike a lot more aggressively than what's priced. Rebecca, good morning and Happy New Year. So how are you positioned for that? Well, you know, it comes down to Happy New Year to you. It comes down to how much is the Fed going to tighten? If they want to get 2% inflation, their target, over a reasonable time frame, they're going to have to tighten more than it's expected. If they don't want to do that because they're worried about undermining the recovery, then they will still tighten, but they're not going to tighten as much as needed. So you have two possible outcomes, higher than expected inflation or more than expected tightening. And the amount of each you get is going to depend on exactly what the Fed does. So we're positioning for both uh, because we can't read the Fed's mind, sadly. So we're looking for higher U.S. bond yields. I think the, the median forecast for the end of this year is around 2%. We think the bias of risk there is clearly higher. We're looking for inflation-sensitive uh, assets like broad, diversified baskets of commodities to protect us against inflation. We're looking at equity markets that are going to be less sensitive to changes in liquidity if the Fed has to pull back liquidity faster than expected. Um, and so we're trying to position for either of those outcomes in our portfolio. So where does that leave you in tech? I mean, we've seen a lot of hedge funds in uh, in December start to sell their, some of their tech holdings, and clearly the last eight days of this year have been quite tumultuous. I mean, obviously, there's some longer-term supports under the tech sector. You've got tech capex, which continues to be very, very strong. Uh, you have buybacks, obviously, helping that sector. These companies are extremely cash-rich. But at the same time, to your point, you've got high valuations. You've got people extrapolating the growth of these companies going forward over the next decade. Some companies may hit that mark. They may meet expectations, but we think the bulk of them probably won't. So if you have those that pricing, and now you have the Fed removing liquidity. These are very liquidity sensitive assets, long duration cash flows. And so they are going to be vulnerable in our view. The question is how much given those offsetting supports I mentioned. But we think that is one reason that you want to look overseas with equities, you know, places that are going to benefit from strong nominal global growth, less sensitive to the liquidity pullback, um, and probably offering much, much better valuations, places like Japan. That would be a place we're looking at now in equities. <laughs> Is that value you're looking for? I'm assuming that it probably is. Um, and if so, how much more does value have to go? Is, is this a trade? Is this a theme? Is this something that has legs? Well, you know, the value play, if you will, and, and um, I would say is is going to be um, dependent to a degree on what goes on with the global economy this year. We think the U.S. is going to have nominal growth that's still very much above consensus expectations. And even with our high inflation expectation, real growth is still going to be quite a bit above potential. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. economy is moderating, but still quite strong. I think a big question to think about how, how far value can go is China. You know, China obviously slowed a lot last year. Um, and now we're seeing increasing, albeit more fine-tuned easing steps to support growth. Can China get its economy back up to that five, five and a half percent growth pace this year? I think if you had both of these big economic engines humming in, in 2022, that would make me a lot more confident that this cyclical leg or value leg, if you will, is going to have sustained legs. So I wouldn't just watch the U.S. I would keep an eye on China, too, given its importance for all of these uh, growth sensitive of stocks, growth in economic growth terms. Yeah, there is a little bit of a narrative that since they saw um, their inflation data come down a little bit, that maybe there's a little bit more room uh, to ease there. Um, does that thesis extend to Europe? Because most individuals we talk to say, if you're going to play the value trade, it's Europe over U.S. Do you buy into that? 
Well, I think you do see a lot of investors who want a certain U.S. exposure just rotate within the market. So I don't necessarily think there's an exodus from the U.S. So I think you'll see a rotation within the U.S. But I also think Europe is pretty interesting right now. The, the European Central Bank, even though they're also seeing high inflation, so far seems more in the transitory camp. Um, and they're likely to lag economic conditions there and let monetary policy stay quite easy. So different from the Fed. Fiscal stimulus there is continuing to roll out thanks to the EU recovery plan. And so that's another support for growth. If you also have a decent global backdrop, I think Europe is going to be a huge beneficiary of this combination of factors. Uh, so I do think there's some upside on European stocks. In recent years, we've really just seen these large luxury brands, the multinationals benefiting. I think this year, the thing to look for is could you see that stimulus backdrop plus a little bit of an improvement in China and a still strong America help some of those domestic sectors as well? Rebecca, pull this all together for me. What kind of rate of return do you think you're going to be penciling in at the end of the year? Well, it's, I think it's going to be a bumpier year when you consider that the Fed is going to be feeling its way a little bit. It knows it needs to tighten, but how much and in what shape? Is it rate hikes? Is it quantitative tightening? What is the data telling us? What's happening with the pandemic? I think that is going to create air pockets along the way. So we are going to see bouts of volatility this year because of, of the pandemic and, and how the Fed is going to navigate this. Um, I, I think you want to make sure you're positioning for higher yields, either through the bond market itself or thinking about, OK, if I have a long only portfolio, what assets are going to protect me against higher yields? Um, equity markets, I think, are, are still well supported, but the, some of those big measures of support, the fiscal, the monetary stimulus we had over the last two years, those are starting to fade. So I think you're going to be looking at lower equity returns this year. Seems like a pretty easy thing to say after mm. the returns we got last year. I mean, one market I would look at if we do get, and again, this is where diversification is so important. You know, if China is in a different place in its cycle, we're all tightening, removing liquidity. They're adding liquidity to their market. They're trying to support growth. Um, yes, we've got the regulatory clampdown in China as they deepen their regulatory ecosystem, but you also have some, some really attractive valuations there and easing conditions. So being long Chinese bonds, looking for opportunities to be long Chinese equities, you know, there's a lot of differentiation in the global economy today. So even if returns overall for equities are lower, I think there's going to be some really interesting opportunities out there. You just have to dig around a bit. 